Eve celebration, notorious for its street-level sleaze, now booming with new construction, like the new Marriott Hotel on your right. It's a Manhattan makeover, a cleanup, but it's also a holdup, because part of every single dollar spent on virtually every major construction project on this island is going right into the greedy, grasping hands of organized crime. Call it a mob tax, if you will. They get at least 2% of the million dollar overall cost. Plus, they get a cut from cement and building supplies, a cut from services, and a kickback from some of the unions involved. And guess who ultimately pays for these ripoffs? You do. We're talking big money in the big city, and not just this big city, because from coast to coast, the high-rise generation of modern mobsters is making money the old-fashioned way. They steal it. Tribune Entertainment and the Investigative News Group present the Geraldo Rivera Specials. Tonight, live via satellite from New York with reports from around the globe and across the country, Sons of Scarface, the new mafia. Al Capone has become an evil legend, but the myth of the gentleman godfather has been exposed. Today's crime captains are more organized, more violent than ever. We drive from that corporation with a bullet in your head. You'll see how they operate, how they're taking your money. Organized crime is big business, from extortion to gambling, prostitution to dope dealing, loan sharking to murder. I was told to hold the little boy in the living room. That's why they stabbed his father to death. And despite recent convictions, the evil empire is growing. Oh. We'll go to Sicily where it all began and where a mob war has drenched the island in blood. They killed my husband and I will fight them until they are destroyed. Then we'll go inside the Cosa Nostra in this country to see the ruthless face of the American mob. Shit. Get that camera out of I ram it up your ass. Yeah. It's a face that's changing. Today it includes Colombian coke dealers, Chinese sex slavers, Jamaican murderers, and the Mexican Mafia. Is there a connection between the prison gangs and crimes committed outside the institution? Yeah, there is. Auto thefts, robberies, everything's all organized. And action. We'll take you in the secret set of a porno film, an industry dominated by organized crime. You'll go inside their brothels, their illegal gambling parlor. Oh, it's a busy one. And you'll be there when the bosses get busted. You guys have to say, Tony? Tonight, you'll witness a nationwide reality that is explosive, brutal, and shocking. Mr. Gotti, John, All right. here comes Geraldo Rivera. Hey, I don't no, think. See, uh... Tonight, you'll go eye to eye with the sons of Scarface. Scarface, it's a perfect nickname for America's first celebrity gangster, Al Capone, the man who combined the bloody criminal style of the old country with the new country's admiration of well-organized business, organized crime, run by fierce, disciplined groups that defied all laws, except for the secret codes of the family, La Cosa Nostra, our thing. What we'll show you tonight is not glamorous. You won't see great actors like Marlon Brando or Robert De Niro playing larger-than-life villains. What we have to show you is ugly, shocking, and it's graphic. Be warned, if this were a movie, it would be at least R-rated. Let's start now with some history and some good and bad news about the present. The good news is the law has finally learned how to attack traditional organized crime. The bad news is untraditional newcomers have arrived. A whole new breed of organized criminals moving in on the legacy of Scarface. Al Capone was the most important of the old guard. The original organized criminal he usually killed only for competitive advantage. He also brought in accountants and made crime a business. Built on blood and booze, Capone's empire prospered. Then a fed named Ness and his band of untouchables begged the organized murderer on a tax rap. Capone died an ex-con, physically destroyed by syphilis. Still, Scarface is larger now than he was in life. De Niro has made him the ultimate bad man, an anti-hero of epic proportions. I'm gonna tell you something. Somebody messes with me, I'm gonna mess with him. <laughs> with Capone gone, Sam Giancana, his former errand boy, rose rapidly to the top of the Chicago heat. His daughter, Tony, the self-described mafia princess, told me how the business changed during her father's reign. 
Well, in the beginning, it was really booze running for uh, Capone or Capone's people. And uh, there was gambling, naturally, and there was prostitution. But with prohibition over, the mob was an organization without a product. Gambling and vice couldn't make up the loss of the multi-billion dollar booze business. Lucky Luciano and a commission of Mafia Hoods had just the answer. It was here at the Hotel Palma in Sicily that a commission of the Mafia decided to sell whatever soul it had and get involved in the drug trade. Sitting around a fancy table in the middle of this ornate room, they may have seemed a group of prosperous businessmen or high-ranking diplomats. In fact, they were an evil bunch, dividing territories and deciding that nothing was beneath them, not even the trafficking of heroin. Coppola's classic film, The Godfather, he picks a scene in which the leaders of the various crime families agree to embrace the heroin trade. I don't want it near schools. I don't want it sold to children. That's an infamia. In my city, we would keep the traffic in the dark, people to call it. They're animals anyway, so let them lose their souls. Although the film is fictional, it's a roughly accurate portrayal of what actually happened. The mafia marketing heroin to the minority areas of the big eastern cities. How much do you spend every day on it? Oh, maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty, you know. Whatever money I could get my hand off, I use it on that. I want to stop. I do want to stop. But I just, I, I don't know how to go about it. With dirty billions pouring in from drug sales, it was inevitable that someone would get greedy. The peace the Mafia Commission had managed to impose since Capone's time broke down when Vito Genovese decided to eliminate his rivals. They included Albert Anastasia, the brutal boss of Murder Incorporated. One October morning, almost 30 years ago, Anastasia and an associate were walking here on West 55th Street in Manhattan. They were heading for the barber shop, located in the lobby of what is now the Omni Park Central Hotel. Anastasia wanted to get a shave and a haircut. It was a shave and a haircut he never got. It was a good morning, Albert. I was called him Albert. Virginia was the manicurist on duty that morning. She has never spoken about what happened until now. Two undisclosed facts emerged from our interview. First, the gunman did not wear masks, as previously reported. Second... Now, Anastasia did not come in alone that morning. He came in with one of his men, Squilanti. I was sitting at my manicuring table. All of a sudden, I looked up and there were these two men firing at Anastasia. They kept shooting him while he got up, and then he fell. They kept shooting until he was down, and I think that was finished. And then they just ran out. Despite the mob's bloody track record, many people who should have known better, even the FBI's J. Edgar Hoover, refused to believe the mafia existed. Then a hood named Valachi blew the whistle, telling the Senate how the crime families were organized, who the godfathers were, and how they initiate their soldiers. <laughs> What I'm telling you, what I'm exposing to you and the press and everybody, this is my doom. In a rare television interview, a more recent mob squealer, Jimmy the Weasel Fradiano, verified the mob's rite of passage. They tell you what you can do, what you can't do. You can never talk to a grand jury. Uh, you got to take the fifth or lie. You never talk to any FBI agents or any policemen. If you do, you got to lie. If you don't lie, you get killed. Mobster Frank Costello followed the code of silence to the letter. I'm not going to answer another question. You just says I'm not under arrest and I'm going to walk out. Costello followed the rules. Fradiano is in hiding because he did not. Would you say that that's probably the most sacred rule? Yes, that, that is a sacred rule, yes. And yet you broke it. I broke it after 30-some years, yes. Why? Well, because they had a contract out on my life. Wearing perhaps the world's worst disguise, the wise guy, Henry Hill, tells us his reasons for deciding to snitch, not fight. You resigned from, from that corporation with a bullet in your head. And uh, there's, uh, there's, there's no way out once you get involved with those people. Anyone that was a threat to them, they, uh, they executed. And uh, I was on that list at the end. Did you ever notice how the word mafia is never mentioned in the Godfather films? That omission is intentional. The result of a deal struck between the producers and Joe Colombo, the boss of a powerful crime family. 
Putting the muscle on the media and the movies and even picketing the offices of the FBI were all part of a public relations campaign begun by Colombo after his sons were arrested. Its theme, the mafia was a myth. The use of the word, a slander against people of Italian descent. There's a conspiracy in this country against every Italian American. Noting that Colombo was under investigation at the time, mob-busting U.S. Attorney Rudolph Giuliani, himself an Italian American, says the mob was again trying the big lie. Uh, the mafia is a minuscule percentage of Italians and Italian Americans. It has nothing to do with the overwhelming vast majority of Italian Americans who are not involved with the mafia, are not criminals, are law-abiding citizens. And what uh, Colombo and some of the others did was create the impression that we had to lie to each other, that Italians wanted to perpetrate the big lie. Ironically, Joe Colombo was gunned down during one of his civil rights rallies, apparently because he broke the mob rule against attracting too much public attention. For a time, Joey Gallo, one of the hoods suspected of arranging the Colombo shooting, was himself quite a public person. He so impressed Bob Dylan. The singer even wrote a song about him. Joey, Joey. It didn't change Gallo's luck. He got blown away as he and his family celebrated his 43rd birthday in this New York clam house. In fact, a lot of these guys get it in restaurants. Carmine Galante was in the midst of enjoying a post-meal cigar when the Grim Reaper came calling. They say he was making a grab for another family's dope trade. Hours after his murder, federal surveillance cameras were recording when the hitman, a guy named Bruno, returned home to congratulations and a hero's welcome. Last year, Bruno got 40 years for the murder, which was, of course, no comfort to Galante, whose death left Big Polly Castellano as the toughest guy on the block. That's Polly on the left. His bodyguard and heir apparent, Tommy Bellotti, is on the right. Here's the pair a few weeks later, in December 1985. They'd made that classic mistake of relaxing in a restaurant. Now, like Gallo's Clam House and Galante's Italian restaurant, Castellano's Steakhouse is also a mafia landmark. So far, no one has written a song about Big Pauli. Did you ever ask yourself why we should care that these guys keep blowing each other away? Uh, Really, uh, Rudolph Giuliani, United States Attorney, the mob buster, why should we care if they keep killing each other? Well, we have to care about it because, number one, you know, murder is something that you have to take seriously. And number two, there's another myth that they keep perpetrating, which is they never harm innocent people. Uh, they don't always do it perfectly. They don't always do it effectively. And innocent people have been shot and murdered as a result of their trying to produce mayhem on the streets. I mean, you can't shoot people in the middle of, in the middle of Manhattan without creating a terrible risk to innocent human beings. Elliot Ness was the scourge of the mob in the 30s in uh, Chicago. Uh, many of the newspapers, the television stations are comparing you to him, the, uh, the new untouchable, <laughs> the untouchable of the 80s. Um, I've read the headlines, but seriously, substantively, how badly has the mob been hurt by the successful prosecutions that you brought? It's been hurt, but it certainly hasn't been destroyed by any means. It's been hurt because large numbers of them have gone to prison, and RICO cases, civil RICO cases, racketeering cases, that allow us to take their money and some of their influence over unions and businesses have now been brought against them and there'll be a lot more than that. So I think there's hope for the future, but by no means is the effort uh, over. With I mean, there's so many a lot things, more to be done. With so many things competing for the government's attention, so many different priorities and priorities constantly changing, is it realistic to expect that your office can keep this at a priority? Oh, I think it has to. I mean, New York has been gravely afflicted by organized crime for generations now. It has to be a priority. It has to be a priority not only of the U.S. Attorney's Office, but of the Department of Justice nationwide. And if we keep the pressure up for five or ten years, then we can have some real permanent effect. But we can't fool ourselves into thinking that the success that we've had now means that it's, uh, I mean, we've won the battle. Define the, really, the harm caused by the mafia to the national institutions, oh to the God, government uh, fabric of society. Give it, us an overview. It, um, it convinces large numbers of people that neighborhoods, communities, businesses are being controlled by gangsters and by this other government that murders people at will. Uh, it, it imposes a tremendous tax, not just monetary, but on, on our moral standing uh, to allow this kind of government to operate, or groups of governments, because there are a lot of these different groups, not just the traditional mafia. What if the Russians were doing what the mob is doing today? They'd be doing a pretty effective job of undermining our society, and unfortunately, these 20, 25, 30 groups are doing a very effective job. Drugs probably uh, illustrates it the most dramatically, but gambling, prostitution, uh, loan sharking, control of labor unions, political influence, all of those things uh, uh, affect us very, very dramatically. Unfortunately, people don't see it as easily as they see the effect of violent crime.
Okay, Rudolph Giuliani, United States Attorney for Manhattan, thanks very much for being Thank with us. Thank you very much, Earl. When we come back, you're going to meet some of the men who dominate the world of organized crime today. So stay with us. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to be talking live with this convict. His name is Matty Trainer. He's in prison in Nassau County, Long Island. Now, Trainer's testimony was supposed to convict his lifelong friend, the mafia leader John Gotti. But at the trial, Trainer double-crossed the prosecutors, and as a result, Gotti walked free. And it should be said that when the 46-year-old Gotti walks, he does so with a kind of expensive elegance. Don't be fooled. It's only skin deep. Although one or two of the hoods occasionally sport a $1,000 suit, most of the top guys look like they'd be more at home playing bocce in a retirement community than playing a role in The Godfather. Incidentally, this guy playing bocce is Vito Genovese, the last real boss of all bosses. Genovese's death in 1969 was the beginning of the end for the original generation of hoodlums. That included cronies of Al Capone, like Chicago's Tony Big Tuna Accardo, who after five decades as a mug, is now in his 80s. So After telling this Senate committee he never ordered anybody murdered, the senators asked Mr. Ricardo about his income. You've never cheated on your income tax? No, sir. What did you say on your tax return when you turned it in? What did you give as the source of your income? I think my tax lawyer put down miscellaneous. Miscellaneous? Yes. <laughs> Fortune Magazine's cover boy, Anthony Fat Tony Salerno, is 75. Until recently, the man labeled the nation's richest mobster spent his days sitting around his dingy Harlem headquarters. There, an FBI bug caught Salerno complaining to a fellow old-timer, 73-year-old Tony Dux Corallo, about a younger mobster's lack of respect. As a key member of the National Mafia Commission, Salerno's reach extended far beyond New York. At another social club meeting, he's overheard ordering the settlement of a jurisdictional dispute between mobsters in Cleveland and Buffalo. Despite his modest appearance, Salerno controls a criminal empire worth between two and three hundred million dollars. One of his principal sources of income is gambling. For example, he's said to control thousands of illegal gambling parlors throughout the country. There are hundreds of them just in Manhattan. Researcher Joanne Torres carried a hidden camera into several establishments. Although there were slot machines. The main action is in the numbers. It's a sort of illegal lottery. I follow Joanne into the joints. Number? Hey, Geraldo Rivera, how are you? How long have you been in the numbers? Numbers? Are the numbers here? I don't know. According to law enforcement sources, one of the biggest and busiest operations uses this flower store as a front. After watching lots of customers walking out without any flowers, we went in. Walking quickly past the anemic floral inventory into the real business in the back room. Oh, it's a busy one. Hi, everybody. Hello. There's a tremendous amount of money. I mean, this is obviously a very... High visitability, uh, high money place. How are you? Nice Although you. both Fat Tony and Tony Ducks received long prison sentences at the recent Mafia Commission trials. Untaxed, unregulated, and mob controlled. Salerno's gambling operation is obviously alive and well. Jackpot. Way to go. Despite his conviction, Salerno remains unrepentant. You guys have to say, Tony? Thank you. If Salerno's an unlikely multi-millionaire godfather, what do you think of the guy in the bathrobe? Visible through the open doorway of his storefront clubhouse, we secretly filmed Vincent the Chin Gigante, sitting at a card table facing the street. Although he looks more like a frail pensioner, 
Gigante is actually one of the most powerful mafia captains in the country. The feds say he's the one who's taken over for the imprisoned Salerno. What's this convicted dope dealer worth? Millions. From construction, gambling, loan sharking, labor racketeering, and the record business. Why does he wear slippers and a bathrobe in the middle of the day? They say it's all part of his act, to appear totally out of it so the cops will stop tailing him. John Gotti, Time Magazine's candidate for mob pinup, doesn't talk to reporters, even on his big day this spring when he was acquitted on racketeering charges. Unlike Salerno or Gigante, Gotti is part of a new breed of hood the cops call wolves, more vigorous and more likely to be involved in drug dealing than the old timers. Well, this wolf dresses like a prince, all tailored suits and daily haircuts. A convicted killer, Gotti drives a custom Mercedes now and has a second home in Florida. Not bad for a guy who claims he's a plumbing parts salesman. Gotti starts his day here at the grandly named Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. It's a little joint in Queens. That's Peter, his older brother, in the doorway. He's also a member of the Mafia. A week after these pictures were taken, the guy in the t-shirt was arrested for attempting to sell a quarter pound of heroin to an undercover policeman. A drug dealer made a mistake in a you would expect reputed mobsters to spend their spare time in some remote location, hiding away. In fact, John Gotti and his alleged criminal associates spend most of their spare time right here at the Ravenite Social Club. In Little Italy, they sit outside, they were at least until we came up, and they pass their time just like ordinary citizens. Here's the boss himself outside the old social club. He shows up most afternoons around five. With him is his younger brother, Gene, currently facing charges of racketeering and dope dealing. I wondered what the two brothers were so busy talking about. Mr. Gotti? John? Hey, one of you. All right. Can you tell us Geraldo Rivera? Yeah, I don't think. Know, I just don't want to talk. All right. Really? It's a free sidewalk, right? Yeah, it's free. Since Paul Castellano's murder back in 1985, Gotti's been suspected of engineering the hit, a sort of hostile business takeover. The man on the left is Bruce Cutler. He's been called the consummate mob lawyer. Many believe your client, John Gotti, killed Paul Castellano so he could take over the Gambino crime family. I've read that in the newspaper, and I understand that they believe that. But obviously, if they had a case, they'd bring it. And they haven't done that. So, do you believe that John Gotti has no connection to the so-called Gambino crime family? If you're asking me, uh, is he in any so-called mafia, my answer is no. I haven't seen any evidence of it. This was Gotti's star defense witness. Currently in jail on an armed robbery rep, Matthew Trainer testified he had no knowledge of Gotti's involvement in organized crime. Now he claims the prosecutor just asked him the wrong questions and got her facts wrong. Yeah, you can look at him and say he's a lifestyle, he's a, he's a thug and a gangster, but the charges that she had against him were not right. But Gotti does run the Gambino family. Yeah. He is a very powerful godfather. Yes. What do they do? What are they into? Gambling, uh, loan shocking. Mm -hmm. Is it not a fact that they get a tax on the heroin that comes into yeah, the New York true. metropolitan area? Yeah. They get so much per kilo, so much per shipment. Yeah, I believe it was 5,000. I don't know what it is now. Um, not only the New York area, other parts of the country. No, if I mean, Trainer had said those things at trial, himself, which is, Gotti would probably be in jail today. And whatever he is or is not guilty of, perhaps you can learn something about John Gotti from a call intercepted by the FBI. The call's nothing special. Just a reprimand to one of his hoods for not promptly returning Gotti's call. Incidentally, Dusky is slang for a made member of the Mafia. Hello. Hi, buddy. Oh, I bought my f***ing balls. Listen, I called your f***ing house five times yesterday. Now, if your wife thinks you're a f***ing Dusky or she's a f***ing Dusky and you're going to disregard my mother phone calls, I'll blow you and that f***ing house up. Imagine if the guy had done something really serious. John Gotti is, as uh, you've heard, the reputed head of the Gambino crime family here in New York, one of the biggest and most powerful crime groups in the country, say the authorities. In a long trial this year, the government thought it had Gotti cold, thanks to testimony the prosecutors expected from a longtime acquaintance who knew all about Gotti, Matthew Trainer. But when Matty Trainer got on the stand, he sang a different song, and Gotti was acquitted. Trainer, a career criminal, joins us now live from Nassau County Jail. Welcome, Matthew. Uh, hey. How big a favor did you do for your old pal, Johnny? How, uh, just how far did you go? How big a favor? 
I guess you can say I've done him a big favor. If it wasn't for me, he'd be doing 40 years in jail. Are you saying that you lied during that trial, Matthew? No, I'm not saying I lied. I'm saying I've done him a favor by stepping forward and exposing the things that the U.S. Attorney's Office were trying to do to him. Uh, the man is a head of the Gambino crime family, is he not? Well, that's what um, everybody claims. What do you mean everybody? That's what you told me on July 16th when I interviewed you well, in yeah, Nassau County that's Jail. that's what you can read in any paper or anything. That's Matthew, what don't you know? Claims. Don't you know from personal knowledge? He's a nice guy. I don't... Uh... Gambler, loan sharking, gets a tax on the heroin coming into the country, didn't you tell me that? Well, you can... You can uh, read into it what you want, but... Uh... I just read into it what you told me. The guy's a bum, a crook, an organized criminal. Powerful criminal. In your criminals. eyes. In your eyes, maybe, but uh, he's just a nice guy. Nice guy. Uh, is he a nice guy today because you talked to him since I talked to you last? Have you talked to him since I talked to you last? No, I was uh, explaining something to you that uh, maybe didn't make sense on camera. Oh. But what I stated in court was actually the truth. I get and, you. Uh, and now, you're, and now you're, you're telling the truth when you spoke to me on July 16th, you were lying. No, I wasn't lying. Uh, when I spoke under oath in court, it was true. I got you. And I didn't put you under oath? No, it wasn't that. Um, I was explaining to you general facts. I didn't explain anything specific about any criminal activity that John oh, Gotti had done your own. or doing. All right, now hold it, Matthew, because uh, we have another guest. We're joined now by Bruce Cutler. Bruce who went to my same law school as a former prosecutor here in uh, New York. He is also the top lawyer for the alleged top mobster in this country, John Gotti. Uh, and he was the lawyer in the trial Matthew Train is talking about, that case in federal court. And you put Matty on the stand. First of all, your reaction to what he said so far. Well, Matt Trainer testified uh, to quite a, f quite a few things at the trial. And uh, he was a government witness, and we were constrained to put him on towards the latter part of our case. But he certainly was not the be-all and end-all, and the only rationale for John being acquitted. John Gotti was acquitted because the government had no case. John Gotti was acquitted because the paid government witnesses who testified against him were proven to be liars, and the jury said that. In fact, one of the jurors who was interviewed after the acquittal said just that on television. It had nothing to do with Matt Trainer. That's not the impression most courtroom observers got. As a matter of fact, when the news broke that Matty Trainer had told me that Gotti's the head of the Gambino crime family, the word amongst lots of newsmen, not just me, was Wow, if he had heard that during trial, Gotti would be a goner right well, now. He'd be in the pen. You see, that's not true. Number one, uh, you keep referring to Matt Trainer as John Gotti's longtime friend. John Gotti doesn't even know him. Uh, as a matter of fact, the trainer indicated at the trial that he didn't personally know John Gotti, that he knew who he was since he had grown up in the wait, same Wait, 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 wait. Matty Trainer, you told me you were the guy's lifelong friend. What's the deal? Bruce Cutler better quit while he's ahead. What do you mean? He says that you never even knew John Gotti. That's not what I said. Wait. What I said was John Gotti didn't know him. Wait Matt a second. Trainer Wait, Matt Trainer, did you know John known, Gotti or not? May have known who John Bruce, was. Let me ask the question. Did you know him, Matty? Bruce Cutler better quit while he's ahead. He's pushing you around. What's the truth now? Did you know John Gotti or didn't you? Didn't you tell me you committed crimes with the Gotti brothers? Didn't you tell me you guys used to go around practicing your faces from when you did the armed robbery so you wouldn't break out laughing so people would be afraid? Did you know John Gotti, Matthew? Well, you make the whole thing up. I said what I said, and uh, I don't have no personal knowledge of John Gotti doing any crimes. Okay, all right. And that's did, what he testified let me say, Did you to. talk to Bruce Cutler in the recent uh, weeks? I said what I said. Did you talk I to Bruce Cutler today, Matthew? John Gotti doing any Bruce Cutler, is there a crimes. mafia? Excuse me? Is there a mafia, Bruce Cutler? Is You're there asking mafia? me? Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, I haven't seen any evidence of, an, of a mafia. If you're asking me is there organized crime, any idiot would say there is. I Naturally, asked you if there there's is. a mafia. I haven't the slightest idea. I haven't seen any evidence of it. I could, In I addition could, to which, wait, Geraldo, me, Bruce, since we are on live, uh, you know, and you invited me to the show, I'd like an opportunity to be heard. You called my client a bum and a crook, and I don't think that's right, and I don't think that's the proper kind of thing to do on a nationally syndicated right. television show. Okay, Bruce. Listen, and I, and I think not that, that anybody soon. would be constrained to answer that. 
right, about so John Gotti that know. What is it? Tell me. Okay, you got 10 seconds, quick. 10 what? seconds to tell you tell why. What's John Gotti really like? As I indicated to you during the tape segment. He's a plumbing part salesman. I never said that. I said to you I would not discuss his personal life with you during the tape interview, and I won't do it now. You're asking me if there's a mafia? As far as I'm concerned, there is no Italian mafia. Is there organized crime? Of course there's organized okay, crime. Okay, I gotta stop. You're out of time. And had John Gotti right. been of the mind to come on the show, if it had been his way to do that, he is would tell you it himself. Buster? Okay, great. All right. Thank you. There's no mafia, but when we come back, we're going to visit Sicily, the beautiful and brutal island in terms of the recent crime where the mafia, even though he says it didn't exist, was born. You'll see what's happening there when we come back. I just want to quickly point out Charlie Rose from the United States Attorney's Office of the Eastern District here in New York. We have learned that he is investigating Matthew Trainer's testimony uh, with the view of possibly bringing a perjury charge against him. So let's just drop that right there. At long last, the struggle against organized crime can be called a war, not just a series of defeats. Now, we've been talking specifically about New York with some mention of Chicago, but this is a war with many fronts. New Orleans, Kansas City, Detroit, Denver, Milwaukee, Chicago. Cleveland, Philadelphia, Los Angeles. And then there's the bloodiest battlefield of all, the Mediterranean island, where it all began. Sicily is an ancient island that bakes in the hot sun of the middle Mediterranean. Rich in history and culture, over the last decade, its beauty has been dimmed by a bloody civil war among gangsters. Here in the ancestral home of the mafia, Rival clans have turned to incredible brutality and mass murder. They were fighting over a rich prize, control of the American drug trade, and mostly they killed each other. But there were at least three big mistakes among the 300 murders committed. Those may prove fatal to the mafia. Their first mistake was killing a crusading judge named Cesar Terranova. In a move unprecedented for this mafia-controlled island, his loving widow decided to make them pay. The mafia is evil, and they killed my husband, and I will fight them until they are destroyed. Giovanna Terranova is an Italian hero. Taking advantage of the mob's historic reluctance to kill women after her husband's murder, she began an organization of fellow widows, demonstrating, taunting, and insulting the proud murderers, the women made them seem smaller and less fearsome. And with passions already heating against the Mafia, they made their second mistake. They killed a cop, General De La Chiesa, Sicily's top cop, and they massacred his wife along with him. De La Chiesa's murder blew away any ambivalence on the part of law enforcement toward the mob. Getting the Mafia became a matter of personal vengeance and honor. Sicily's current chief of police gets hot talking about the Mafia. We will win. I'm angry because we have to put an end to this tragedy. They are killers. But we need the support of government and of society. This is the Mafia's biggest mistake ever. His name is Tommaso Buscera. A survivor, he was leader of the losing side during the mob's recent civil war. Pipo Calò, his arch enemy and rival for the American dope trade, allegedly murdered most of Buscera's family. After Calò got his wife, sons, sons-in-law, and assorted other relatives, Buscetta decided better rat than die. Along with about 30 lesser mafiosi, he broke the mob's code of silence. Now a federally protected witness in the United States, Buscetta has already testified in the successful Pizza Connection prosecution in New York, while his testimony in Sicily has led to an incredible trial of his former co-criminals. This heavily fortified and closely guarded Sicilian courthouse is called the Bunker, and it's the scene of what surely must be one of the most extraordinary trials in the history of criminal justice. It's the so-called Maxi Trial, the mass prosecution of over 450 alleged members of the Sicilian Mafia. It must be seen to be believed. Mob hoodlums long thought untouchable watch the proceedings from behind cages. The accusations against them contained in an 8,000-page indictment range from extortion to theft, drug trafficking to murder. 
One of the most dramatic moments in the year-long trial came when Buscetta confronted his rival Calò in open court. I didn't kill your sons. I didn't kill your sons. You liar! Tension from the mob trial has spread throughout Palermo, Sicily's capital. Mobile squads of police daily set up roadblocks to prevent any attempt at freeing the imprisoned chieftains. It wouldn't be easy in any case. The so-called bunker is aptly named. The modern courthouse grafted onto an 18th century prison is guarded by over 2,000 crack troops and national police brought in from throughout Italy. Mafia dons who outside these walls rule multi-million dollar criminal empires. Here live humbly, stripped to the waist, to endure the oppressive heat and the other humiliations of prison life. Because a total of 25 police and prosecutors have been murdered by mobsters trying to stop this proceeding, the magistrates arrive for court in armored convoys. Chief among the good guys is Giovanni Falcone. Like Rudolf Giuliani in our country, Falcone is the Mafia's number one enemy in his. A crusading driven man, he granted us a rare interview. We knew it would be difficult, but that will not stop us, the few government institutions willing to take on the Mafia. But does he fear the Mafia? The problem is not that we are afraid of the Mafia, of course we are. But we have to live with this fear and win. How are the good guys doing in Sicily? Can the Mafia really be defeated? Tommy and Gelati heads our Drug Enforcement Administration office in Italy. We spoke in Rome. The Mafia has been seriously hurt in terms of arrests. They've been seriously hurt in terms of, of seizures of drugs. But more importantly, they've been hurt because they've been exposed for the first time. Assuming most of these guys are convicted, then the Sicilian Mafia will have been dealt a serious blow. It would have been hurt and badly by the big trial going on here. Regardless of the trial's outcome, the so-called honored society has been hurt in another way. They've been revealed as traitors, informants, who would do or say anything to hurt their enemies and to save themselves. Stay with us. We'll be right back. These days, the sons of Scarface come in all races, creeds, and nationalities. Sort of a United Nations of crime. As the leadership of the traditional families gets sent off to prison, like little Nicky Scarfo of Philadelphia, or dies from natural or unnatural causes, like Angelo Bruno, also from the city of brotherly love, the vacuum left is being quickly filled by what the authorities call non-traditional crime groups. Because so much of organized crime is imported, a lot of the burden for fighting it falls on the shoulders of a special investigations unit of the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Best known for the Border Patrol, these plainclothes cops go around finding illegal aliens accused of having committed organized crime. He come here, he live here, but uh, he's not here today now. She was lying. The special agents spot their man trying to escape out the back door. A resident alien from Jamaica. The target is a career criminal with a 20-year history of drug dealing and armed robbery. Under federal law, an alien is deportable if he or she commits even one felony. He and these others about to receive a one-way ticket out of the United States are said to be connected to organized Jamaican gangs called posses. The posses grew out of the urban violence surrounding the Jamaican elections of 1980. Warring factions associated with the two major political parties evolved from mere street gangs into organized criminal groups. Thousands are now operating in this country, and they've brought with them a pattern of drug dealing and gunslinging. According to the authorities, the posses have been responsible for approximately 100 homicides in New York, 12 more in Washington, D.C., 31 in Houston, 15 others in Dallas, 13 in Kansas City, and well over 150 in South Florida. Right now, cops from Dade County, Florida, 
have one suspected murderer under surveillance. The man is wanted in Kansas. He's supposedly hiding in a house just a block away. The home the Metro-Dade cops are raiding is allegedly a safe house. One used by Jamaican Posse members on the run. The country just visited Jamaica. Where's your documents to be here in the country? I'm here legally. In their search, the police find several illegal aliens, as well as numerous loaded weapons. Then, with the assistance of an INS agent, they take a closer look at the identification offered by one of the men. They spelled uh, United States wrong on that ID he has. <laughs> it's United States. His photo matched the one on the federal computer, and a subsequent fingerprint check revealed that this indeed is the suspect wanted for murder in Kansas City. The next organized crime group comes from the other side of the world, the Yakuza of Japan. Nearly 20 times larger than the American Mafia, Yakuza members brand themselves with their distinctive tattoos. They also cut off their fingers to show devotion to the Godfather. Like most American organized crime groups, they prosper by selling drugs and controlling prostitution and gambling. More importantly, the huge organization could soon figure heavily in the American crime scene. This recent police sting in Hawaii put a group of Yakuza attempting to run guns from here to the troubled nations of Southeast Asia. This thing penetrates six inches of concrete or three quarters of an inch of steel. The mainland of the United States has already been exposed to various Asian organized crime groups. They come for us about all my money. California store owner New Tan is the victim of extortion at the hands of Vietnamese gangs operating just south of Los Angeles. This is what happens when these thugs don't get paid their protection money in time. Police say these buildings were burned down intentionally, but the owners refuse to discuss it. Why? They scare, you know. You know the the Vietnamese, the Chinese, um, if I talk, I die tomorrow. Because they have such little faith that the cops can protect them, some small communities in this state now have police task forces designed to gain the confidence of store owners like Newton and to stop the Vietnamese gangsters. Chinatown exists in virtually every big city. It's exotic and most visible concentrations of Oriental American life. Many of these communities have been plagued recently by street gangs. Their gangs often working under the direction and control of the Chinese mob. The young thugs control turf in Chinatown through violence and intimidation. Shootouts between rival gangs battling for bigger territories are common, and all too often innocent victims get caught in the crossfire. According to law enforcement sources and undercover agents, the ambitious mobsters have set their sights beyond Chinatown. Well, they try to take over Chinatown, and they try to take over the... Uh, whole territory of the United States. Otherwise, you know, they try to take over mafia. You think they're trying to become the new mafia? Exactly. Stephen Wong is a brave man. Fed up with Oriental organized criminals for the last couple of years, he's volunteered to work undercover for the feds, helping to expose the leadership of a highly organized Chinese gang called United Bamboo. What kinds of criminal activities were they involved in? Prostitution, extortion, you know, contract murder. Narcotics. One of the stings engineered by Stephen Wong happened at the Desert Inn in Las Vegas in 1985. There, an undercover FBI agent posing as a drug buyer was offered 300 kilos of pure heroin by the leader of United Bamboo called Yellowbird. Huh? Talk about that before. Yellowbird and 10 other United Bamboo members were convicted in federal court last year and are now in prison. This nationwide sweep of massage parlors was also part of the crackdown on Chinese organized crime, with arrests in San Francisco, coinciding with others in Denver, New York, and elsewhere. In 1985, we uncovered an elaborate scheme, whereas one organization staffed brothels across the country with illegal aliens from Taiwan that were smuggled into the country by this organization. According to Jim Goldman of the INS, the women were kept against their will until they were able to pay the money it cost to be smuggled here. And there are still many brothels using similar methods to get and keep their women. This young lady was one of hundreds recruited by the Chinese ring. Did you know that you were going to become a prostitute here in the United States? I only found out after I got here. Why didn't you leave? I cannot. Who took the money? The lady that we call Big Sister. Were you a slave then to Big Sister? 
You can put it that way. In New York, Stephen Wong took our hidden camera into one brothel fronting as a massage parlor. How did you get in? What story did you use to get in? Well, I'm a salesman for um, condoms. A condom salesman? Right. But you had no doubt in your mind that it was really a, a, a brothel. Well, not only in my mind. You know, everybody knows. Later, we paid a surprise visit to one of the places busted during the federal suite. Under new management, it was back in business. Hi, where are you from? Excuse us. Sorry. Sorry. I'd like you now to meet Stephen Wong. He's the very brave man, the, uh, the very brave condom salesman <laughs> we just saw in that report. Remember, Stephen is a private citizen, an author. He's not a cop. Stephen, do you have to be Chinese to fight Chinese organized crime? Well, unfortunately, it will be easier. Obviously. Why are there so few Chinese policemen? Well, because most of the uh, Chinese parents, they don't like the idea of their kids being a uh, law enforcement, because traditionally in China, the uh, cops are so corrupt. Uh, this is uh, John Shaw. He heads that special investigative uh, unit that we told you about for the INS responsible for dealing with alien crime. Is this a symptom of the new problems we face dealing with these new, untraditional organized crime groups? Uh, yes, it is, Geraldo. Uh, organized crime in America is easily becoming a cottage industry. Uh, it, uh, we don't discriminate, or the participation is not discrimination, uh, it's not discriminated based on any particular group. Uh, everyone has equal rights to participate. In crime? In crime. Uh, it just sounds like uh, the more we get the handle on it, the tougher it's going to get. Thank you both for joining us. We'll be right back. been organized along ethnic or national origin lines, but now the soldiers are coming from all directions. In New York, Florida, California, and elsewhere around the country, the authorities have been after the Hells Angels and similar groups. Many members have been charged with crimes ranging from drug trafficking to murder. Law enforcement authorities had long suspected the existence of a link between traditional organized crime, the Mafia, and outlaw motorcycle gangs, groups like the Hells Angels and others. The first real proof of that collusion came from a case here in Canada. It involved a biker turned mafia enforcer by the name of Cecil Kirby. Why don't you list the various crimes you've committed? One murder, a uh, dozen bombings, 20 or 40 extortions, half a dozen arsons, numerous assaults. With the price on his head, the subject of Tom Renner's book, Mafia Enforcer, conceals his identity. So what geographic areas did you work? Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, uh, New York, Connecticut, Miami. So did the border between the countries stop you at all? No. The, the, the border is just imaginary as far as uh, I'm concerned and organized crime is concerned. Why did you decide to turn snitch? Why turn informant? Well, I felt that after seven years of doing bombings and, uh, and uh, contracts to kill people that my time was coming up. To find the final non-traditional organized crime group, we went to jail. One brand of mobster operates inside the closed world of the nation's prisons. In jails like this one in Santa Clara County, California, the organized criminals are the prison gangs, and they're in the business of selling everything from drugs to protection. They come in all varieties. One of the oldest and most powerful of the prison gangs, though, is the so-called Mexican Mafia. Like the Japanese Yakuza, many of these guys are also festooned with tattoos. Because each prison houses several rival gangs, the affiliated inmates are kept separated. So what kind of crimes are the prison gangs into? They're into uh, murder, rape, protection racketing, uh, smuggling. Have you committed worse crimes in the joint than you ever did out of the joint? Yeah, I got all my education in prison. Yeah, you say that. So is there fighting now going on between the gangs? Yeah, there is. There is. There's... Well, they start killing each other, man. I mean, you know, uh, weapons start coming out of the woodwork. Uh, hits start going out. Suicide missions start taking place right in front of the man. Just hit him, you know. If you don't do it, you're going to get hit. 
So if you're caught up in the game, you're caught up in the game. How does the prison gang tie into the crimes committed outside the prison? By recruiting. These guys are some of the new recruits. Signed up in prison, they're working their way up through the ranks by selling dope on the streets of Southern California. He got dime bags of wheat in his hand like cigars. This lady wasn't recruited. She married into the family. As her neck tattoo once proclaimed, she was the wife of Champ Reynoso, the chief enforcer and hitman of the Mexican mafia. Reynoso was right-hand man to Joe Morgan, homicidal founder of the violent gang. He wants to see the fear in, in their face. And he wants to tell them why they're dying, when they're dying. Approximately how many homicides, how many murders did your husband commit? Forty that I know he's gotten away with. Four zero? Four zero. Who did he do that for? Who did he kill for? Um, for their, their, their gang, their prison gang, the M.A. Mexican Mafia. Did you ever personally witness your husband kill anybody? Yes. Tell me about it. I went with them on this one. Um, we had all slammed some heroin, and then we all got in the car and we drove. We got to this one guy's house, and he owed him for a bunch of whites and a little bit of heroin. And he didn't have all the money. Well, I was told to hold the little boy in the living room. I said, OK. So they went in the bedroom, and they had the door open. They didn't close it. And me and the little boy just watched why they stabbed his father to death. And the little boy was kicking me and fighting me, trying to get away so that he can go in there to his father. Are you frightened? Yes, I am. Because um, they're expanding their horizons, or whatever you want to call it, to Denver, Colorado, to Hawaii, to any major cities that they feel they can control. So they really are trying to be competition for the old mafia? Yes. If there's a spy master in the current war on organized crime, he's our next guest, the man whose agents have been successfully bugging the hoods. He's Ronald Goldstock, the director of the New York State Organized Crime Task Force. As organized crime becomes more diversified, though, these various groups, Jamaicans, Colombians, Canadians, etc., is your job going to be that much more difficult, keeping track of these guys? Sure. You know, electronic surveillance has uh, been an unfortunate byproduct of organized crime. Uh, we've had to, because it's such an intractable problem and so serious, uh, use electronic surveillance, which invades everybody's right to privacy. But on the other hand, that it was absolutely critical in dealing with traditional organized crime. Is it tougher? It is going to be just as critical in dealing with the new groups. If there's a harmonic convergence that exists, it exists for the new groups as well at this particular time. That is the challenge for law enforcement. And electronic surveillance is going to be a critical factor in that. In fact, because there are so many languages being spoken out by so many different people, Congress has passed new legislation allowing law enforcement to intercept those conversations in foreign languages and listen to them at a later time when we can get translators. Good luck. Ronald Rostock. In our next hour, we're going to talk about the mob and the business of sin, gambling, vice, and the newest golden goose of all, the booming business of pornography. So stay with us. Mob and pornography, not exactly a victimless crime. The star of Deep Throat, Linda Lovelace, says it was a matter not of sex or money, but of life and death. My being involved in it, you know, was not because of a financial situation. My being involved in it was the fact that there was 45 pointed at me. Sons of Scarface will continue in a moment. We don't have any time to waste, but I had to show you this. This is right in our own studio. Remember I told you about how widespread illegal gambling parlors were? We found this place just by accident. I swear to God, a maintenance man told us about it. This is right in our own building. Here's the card. I'll read it on the way up the stairs. Night walk in the sanctuary, blackjack, dice, heart of the theater district. Uh, they say it's a, a private club. Uh, Broadway Richie's, the door was open. This is right off our own studio. Here, check this out. It's too, it's too much. You got to see it. Here, come right here, Gary. Here's a, uh, the blackjack table right over here. Here, come on, Gary. Look at this. On the, my left here, you got uh, a full bar. And then over here, you have the, uh, the craps tables. <laughs> uh, night walk in the, uh, the sanctuary, Broadway Riches. 
All right, now, as long as we're talking about gambling, let's go to Las Vegas. The party's pretty much over there for the mob now, but there was a time when the mob would have agreed with Elvis Presley, Viva Las Vegas. It all started in 1931, when Vegas was allowed to introduce gambling to bring income to this depressed desert town. But the real landmark year was 1946, when a mobster named Benjamin Bugsy Siegel opened the Flamingo Hotel. Using money stolen from Teamster pension funds, the mob invested heavily in Vegas after that, in essence making this a town the mob built. The wise guys knew that overt gangsterism would be bad for the tourist business, so the Chicago crime families that ran Las Vegas declared it off limits for mob violence. The dirty work was done elsewhere, like Hollywood. Goodbye, Bugsy. For the Chicago mob especially, Vegas was like the golden goose. For years, turning out millions and millions of dollars worth of skim. The Chicago mob had a piece of all kinds of different action, from vending machines and restaurants to the slots and card tables. Then last year, the Chicago representative here in Vegas, a man by the name of Tough Tony Spilatro, was ordered back to Chicago for some meetings. A short time later, he and his brother Michael were found beaten to death in a cornfield in northern Indiana. In recent years, particularly in the last decade, there's been a big positive change in Las Vegas. I love this country, man. Crusading ex-FBI agent Bill Romer should know. He was on the case for 30 years. So was Vegas rotten with mob influence then? It, in the 60s and 70s, it was very definitely. Uh, the hotels that were the worst here were the, the Stardust by far. Uh, that was the flagship of the mob, certainly the Flamingo. That was uh, one of the very worst hotels. Where once they tolerated the underworld businessman, the authorities in Vegas have become very edgy when they suspect anyone connected to their casinos is or has also been connected to the mob. In this new climate of caution, even someone as renowned as Frank Sinatra can be embarrassed. In 1981, for example, the chairman of the board sought a license to be entertainment consultant to Caesar's Palace. But he was brushed by the appearance of a mob connection when this famous photo surfaced. Taken in 1976, surrounding Sinatra were crime family bosses, Carlo Gambino, Paul Castellano, and a mobster soon to turn informant, Jimmy the Weasel Fradiano. Sinatra said he didn't know their criminal backgrounds at the time the picture was taken. Did you have any information about any of the people that were in that photograph with you? Did you know any of them by sight? Uh, I later found out that I was introduced to somebody named Jimmy, and I later found out it was this Fink the Weasel, so I didn't know him at the time. Jimmy Fradiano. Yeah. The famous picture of uh, Sinatra with the hoods. You're in that picture, right? Yes, I am. Did Sinatra know who you guys were? When oh, that picture sure, he knew who I was. He's the one that... He wanted his picture taken with Gambino. And he knew who you were? I mean, well, he knew yeah, you he were knew, mobsters? He knew who I was, yeah. Because I've known Sinatra since 1947. I wish that we didn't have to discuss Mr. Fradiano because he's a confessed murderer, a perjurer, and I would rather not discuss him involved with my own life. Well, Mr. Sinatra, That's a fair enough question. Yes, unfortunately, I, I can appreciate what you're saying, but... Uh, it is in the public record, and Mr. Fradiano has received a great deal of acclaim as a very creditable witness. The entire community of Las Vegas seems eager to put the past behind them. Bob Stupek, he's the owner of Vegas World, is the only casino operator who would speak with us. We went to 17 casinos and asked for interviews and were turned down. Only Vegas World, only you would consent to give us an interview. What were they afraid of? I guess maybe they don't want to talk to you because you talk about things that you shouldn't talk about. Uh, the mob. The mob is something of the past. It's a history. Although Vegas is unquestionably a more honest and wholesome place, some people actually long for the good old days of gangs and gangsters. They're among the group we call the mob dolls, the party girls, women who are attracted by the mobster's money or power and who enjoy a little danger with their love lives. Well, I like exciting guys. Former showgirl and author Liz Renee was for many years the girlfriend of gangster Mickey Cohen. Do you feel a sense of nostalgia for the old days? Um, yes, I guess I do, in a way. 
these guys just had a lot of charisma and a lot of, well, they took me to floating crap games in Brooklyn and all kinds of sneaky, forbidden things, and I was only in my 20s. Compare the hoods today with the hoods you knew during your 20s. Uh, some of the, the people that have been around uh, lately that are getting a lot of news, like, for example, uh, Spilato. Um, he wasn't in the same league at all with these guys. Uh, to me, he seemed like a punk, a bum. Those kind of people just don't compare with the Frank Costellos and Vito Genovese's and people like that. Joining us now live in Chicago is Antoinette Giancana. She's the daughter of one of the most powerful mobsters, the late Sam Giancana. She has described the self-described mafia princess of book and TV fame who not too long ago posed nude in uh, Playboy. Tony, welcome. How are you doing? Fine, and how are you doing in New York? Good, but what would your dad have said if he uh, saw those Playboy pictures? I think he would have enjoyed them in oh, the end. God, sure. They were very well done. Yeah, what kind of guy was he? A tough kind of man. We knew where we stood with him on many occasions. Are you embarrassed now, looking back, that he was your dad? No, not now. Maybe a couple of years ago I would have been, but not now. Why? Because I've developed a love for the man that I had never realized that I had. It just took all these years for all of this to come out. But he was, arrested, he was arrested 50 times before he was 21, three murder arrests? All right, three murder raps. Those were just raps. They were not in, they were indictments, but no convictions. So he was a good guy, a bad good man, or a, ba a good bad man, which was it? Oh, I either either. <laughs> either either. Okay, Tony G and Connor, the Mafia Princess, thanks, uh, thanks for joining us. Pornography, and I'm not talking about Playboy magazine, pornography, real hardcore pornography is a blight, it's an eyesore, and some would even call it a disease. It's also easy money for the mobsters who's, who have muscled in on pornography. Stay with us, we'll check that out. You're looking again at a live shot of New York's Times Square just outside our studio. Once it was a center for wholesome entertainment, but as you can see, it went sour as the sex business moved in. The same thing has happened in many other cities. Pornography is big, dirty business, just the kind of business that suits the mob. This is what porno films used to look like. Flickering images of men and women often wearing masks and hats to hide their identities. Called smokers, these films were crude and crudely photographed. Over the years, the production values have improved, but most mainstream porn still tries for a sense of naughty fun. And though many Americans believe pornography is a victimless crime, the evidence you're about to see suggests there is definitely a dark side to the dirty business. Thanks to the video porn explosion, the industry has grown into a $10 billion a year giant. Law enforcement estimates organized crimes take at about half that amount. That ranks porno with drugs and gambling as the biggest money makers for the underworld. Deep Throat is the most profitable X-rated movie ever made. But one of the men behind that film was Anthony Perino. And according to the authorities, Perino was a made member of the Mafia. The Linda Lovelace was the star of Deep Throat, a film that made tens, perhaps even hundreds of millions of dollars. Now a suburban housewife, she has all too vivid memories of her brief encounter with pornography and the mob. In Out of Bondage, you write, this is the bottom line. If you buy a ticket to a pornographic movie, some of that money probably goes directly to the mafia. How did you react when you found out that the people who made Deep Throat were connected? Um, I guess I was really basically surprised because I had these, you know, living, you know, my father was a police officer and I grew up in a middle class neighborhood and all that kind of thing and when you heard of organized crime you thought of really you always imagined very evil people and uh, Tony Perino was a very nice uh, not very nice person like a grandfather type and the grandfather who was a made member of the Colombo crime family I was surprised how do you react to the fact that the film grossed tens of millions of dollars so much of it going to mafia hoodlums well my my being involved in it you know was not because of a financial situation my being involved in it was the fact that there was 45 pointed at me, that there was an M16 semi-automatic machine gun being pointed at me. 
Not everyone involved in the porno business feels like a victim. Barbara Dare, featured in this month's Hustler magazine, is the current sensation. You don't feel like a victim? Of course not. Women that choose to do it, choose to do it. I choose to do it. I do it because I want to do it. I feel good about doing it. Certainly you've heard the stories, though, of the mob starting the business or the mob being influential, certainly here in Los Angeles. I have never come in contact with the mob in my business. People talk and they say the mob started pornography. It used to be underground. It used to be more where if you wanted to get an adult tape, you had to go to a bookstore and you had to do it real secretly. secretly. Now it's not. It's a business. The distributors they were ordinary people. Can you see her hand in a schlong? Ron Jeremy directs and stars in pornographic movies. Well, I mean, as far as any organized crime involvement, it wouldn't be in any level that I'm familiar with. I'm just an actor, and I direct some of these once in a while. And I've never seen any example of organized crime, but if it exists, it wouldn't be in a level that I'm aware of. If it did exist, it would be maybe producer, distributor level, or areas that I don't have to deal with. So I've never really seen it. Marcella Cohen was the chief prosecutor in the largest pornography case ever brought. Called My Porn, it resulted in the conviction on obscenity charges of two of the Perino brothers. You have to consider that my porn represented not only an obscenity case, but there were other types of charges such as racketeering, interstate transportation of stolen property, criminal infringement of copyright, child pornography. In fact, one of the cases alleged and the defendants were convicted of possession and sale of 44 Ingram M10 machine guns and silencers. Despite the convictions of the Perino brothers, we found in Los Angeles that successful porn companies die hard. Arrow Film and Video, for example, the company once run by the Perino brothers, still holds the distribution rights to Deep Throat, and is still in business here in the San Fernando Valley. A spokesman for the company refused to give us an on-camera interview, but did admit that Anthony Perino, a made member of the Mafia, is still affiliated with the company. In fact, according to law enforcement sources, and to a former employee of Arrow Film who asked we keep his identity protected. Mafia member Perino actually still runs the company. Tony Perino owns Arrow Film. He's there off and on in the day. Butchie Perino works across the way in a duplicating plant. He's there um, all day. But if the Perino brothers are the sultans of smut, meet the prince of porn, Robert Sturman of Cleveland, Ohio. He's divided the country into what he calls the 10 erogenous zones and is said to operate over 200 businesses in 19 states. And Sturman's also reputed to have heavy underworld connections. Example, his enforcer was said to be this man, Robert DiBernardo, a mafia hood also known as DB. How does the mob make money in pornography? Well, they practically ran the, the pornography industry. Jimmy the Weasel Fradiano ran into DB when he tried to get into the porn business. It was at a big meeting of newly initiated Mafia members in New York City. I asked Terry, I said, who in the hell is this guy DB? He said, there he is right there. He was sitting right next to him. So I told him, I said, hey, you know, I wanted to get into pornography. He said, well, you should have done it five years ago. You'd have been a millionaire today. In June of last year, DB disappeared. He is now presumed dead. Since that time, bombings, arson, and murder related to pornography businesses in Chicago, Houston, and North Carolina have come under investigation. Many think there's a struggle for power going on among organized criminals linked to the skin trade. When we come back, we'll watch a police sting operation as the cops try to fight the free-for-all organized crime competition in South Florida. Stay with us. Very special guest. In the Prohibition era, he worked undercover for Elliot Ness in the same group of government agents called the Untouchables because they couldn't be bought or bribed. At age 85, he is the last surviving original Untouchable. Ladies and gentlemen, Al Wallpaper Wolf. Welcome on the show. Now, uh, now, they call you wallpaper because when you guys took over a building, you confiscated everything but the wallpaper. I don't know about anybody else. That was my trade. That was your trade, yeah. confiscation, when the guys were the bad guys. Well, now, you, uh, you've seen Robert Stack in the old Untouchables yeah. TV series. I know you coached Kevin Cosner in the movie. Which is more like the real Elliot Ness? Well, 
Kevin Costner at the beginning is more like the real Elliot Ness. What was Ness like? Tell us. Very passive man. A passionate man. Yeah. Oh, pa like passive. A, a passive. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. But effective, though. Yeah. What about Al Capone? I know you really meant Al Capone, Scarface. Oh, he was Al Capone. He was the boss of, of Chicago. Did he scare you when you met him? No. In fact, he complimented me. What did he say? He said, I heard all about you. He says, you're a nice fella. I said, I hope so. <laughs> he, says, uh, he says to me, uh, I heard you wouldn't frame anybody. You'd leave and make bond. I said, I'm not the judge and the jury. That's up to them. Were you guys really untouchable? Tell me. You didn't sneak a little booze? For, for myself? I can only speak for myself. Okay. There was leaks? Yes, there was. But you'll find a, a bad apple in every bushel. Okay. But you were straight. Oh, I went... Uh, no, I did. I went from there to... The, I, was a, I was a revenue in Kentucky. I was an internal revenue agent. A revenue. Okay, yeah. oh, we got to go. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Because, you know, in your day, yeah. the crime spotlight was on Chicago and illegal whiskey, right? Yeah. Now we're going to go to South Florida for a police thing that ironically has to do with illegal whiskey again. So I want you to watch this with me, okay? Al Wallpaper Wall. Here's a mobster from Buffalo, a hood from Philadelphia, and yet another gangster from New York City. They're among the mafia's population explosion in the Sunshine State, busy turning South Florida into open territory for gun running, narcotics trafficking, extortion, and murder. They're doing business. They're doing business every day. This is the story of Operation Cherokee, a successful two-year undercover sting directed against the mixed bag of sun-loving gangsters. With an ironic echo from the golden age of prohibition, the central focus of this thing was also whiskey, supposedly hijacked whiskey. The guy in the red cap is the star of the show. He convinced the mob he was a hood, a hitman and a truck hijacker named Danny. For two years, Danny associated with gangsters like Edward Schiandria and another Richie Del Gaudio, an alleged enforcer of the Gambino crime family. This was the main stage for the whiskey sting, a warehouse filled with supposedly stolen booze. It was here that the mafia hoods came to transact their business. They thought they were buying stolen whiskey at cut rate prices. There were, though, two things they didn't know. First of all, the supposed hijacker they were dealing with was actually an undercover cop. And secondly, everything that happened here was being videotaped by a camera hidden in that old video machine. The actual liquor deliveries themselves were also secretly filmed by investigators and Miami area news people. The men carrying in the supposedly stolen booze are also undercover cops. Secret meetings between Danny, who's really Deputy Sheriff David Green, and the operation's main target, a mafia boss, were also taped. As we watched, Deputy Green offered Anthony the Gov Guarnere a sample of the supposedly stolen booze. This apparently harmless senior citizen has been a made member of the Mafia for more than 30 years. What Guarnieri does not know is that he has already been indicted by the grand jury. Green's role as a hijacker must have been very convincing. Until near the very end of the operation, the targeted mobsters trusted and dealt with him freely. But what if his cover had been blown? What would the capo do? What would the dons do if they found out you were actually a cop? Uh, it could be a very serious situation. There'd probably be a uh, sudden death in the family. Dealing with them since the days of Meyer Lansky and his pal Jimmy Blue Eyes Allo, the cops in these parts have become expert at shadowing Florida's mob. No wonder everybody takes wax at you guys. Like their pals up north, these racket guys are also creatures of habit, frequenting the same spots time and again. Of all the joints targeted by the cops for investigation, none is as notorious as this place, the Gold Coast Restaurant. A mob hangout for 30 years, the Gold Coast has hosted hoods dating from Meyer Lansky all the way to the current godfather, John Gotti. If he survives the wrath of his enemies and the reach of future prosecutors, New York's Gotti is expected to relocate in the neighborhood. The cops here are already tailing his associates. We watched as they caught this meeting between Joe Cavello, Gotti's chief of bookmaking, and Gambino family soldier Richie Del Gaudio. The next day, as Operation Cherokee was coming to a close, we attempted to confront Del Gaudio. The mobster's cover company was apparently named by someone with a sense of humor, 
It's called East Coast Syndicators. Appropriate since it's an alleged front for syndicate activities ranging from bookmaking to burglary. Hi. Is uh, Richie here? No, he ain't here. Nobody's here. Can you tell him that Geraldo Rivera's here? No, no, he's here. Whoa. Do you know when he'll be back? No, he won't. He's on vacation. Until when? Until next year. I don't think you're being sincere. The next day, I finally met Richie face to face when federal and local authorities began the Cherokee Roundup. Richie, they say you're a soldier in the Gambino crime family. You want to comment on that? To the Gov, this latest in a long string of arrests seemed the minor inconvenience. Good morning. The old gentleman was charged as top gun in a criminal conspiracy involving drug trafficking and dealing in counterfeit and stolen merchandise. Of his associates, Benny Musso also went down for dealing in counterfeit merchandise. Bill Spatuzzi was accused of drug dealing and criminal conspiracy. Patrick D. Cressida was arrested for distribution of counterfeit credit cards and conspiracy to distribute drugs. Or Richie got the book thrown at him. Conspiracy to deal drugs, running a bookmaking operation, loan sharking, and the firearms violation. The mob's involvement in the dope business is the focus when we come back. Stay with us. lawyer Bruce Cutler, the big lie that the mafia does not exist has pretty much been put to rest. Along with big lie number two, that the mob is not involved in dope dealing. Believe that one and you're the dope. You're watching a mobster make a heroin delivery in Philadelphia. Introduced in the recent Pizza Connection trial, this video and other evidence was used to uncover a multi-billion dollar heroin smuggling operation from Sicily to the United States. Before it was destroyed, the ring sold thousands of pounds of dope and scattered bodies across two continents. For the last several decades, the Mafia has been responsible for about half the heroin coming into the country. As a result of aggressive law enforcement, the government estimates the current mob share at about 15%. Two of the emerging organized crime groups have taken up the slack. Open your hand. Who do you buy this from? Mexicans. The Mexicans, mostly? Yeah. You know them? Are they in the Mexican Mafia? Yeah. Here in Portland, Oregon, and throughout the Pacific Northwest, the Mexican Mafia controls the heroin trade. We watched as undercover officers negotiated for bulk purchases. I'll do some business. If he's got the best stuff, I'll do some business. Like I said, he got the best. The product being sold by the Mexican Mafia is black tar heroin, and it's being distributed all up and down the coast. As in traditional organized crime, the Mexican Mafia is also a family business. But the DEA and others predict it is the Chinese who will soon dominate the international heroin trade. In Italy, a Chinese dealer attempting to arrange a long-term contract to supply the stuff to the Sicilian Mafia was arrested and forced to testify in the big trial going on there. Heroin is big bucks, but when it comes to American dope dollars, the real action these days is in cocaine and the various mobs are all involved. Organized crime figures, the head of families, are now directly tied to the Colombian kingpins in the trafficking of cocaine. To say that firsthand, we joined the organized crime unit of the Broward County Sheriff's Office in South Florida as they closed in on a five kilo, $165,000 cocaine deal. After the alleged mob middleman passed the dope to an undercover agent, the trap was sprung. Suspect in rear seat, two Yusu guys in the UC vehicle. Now, spread eagle. I want to know about your source. I want to know about the 55-year-old Italian guy you got it from on the beach. I don't know any 55-year-old Italian guy. Okay, is he tied to organized crime? I don't know what organized crime is, okay? Is he tied to the mob? Mafia? I don't, what is the mob? I don't know what the mob is. What remains of the code of silence makes it difficult to trace these deals to the source. But the cops did get lucky on one deal involving a mob associate named Ralph Campagna. Here he is arriving at a South Florida hotel with his five-year-old son. A hell of a way to do a dope deal. The dope was passed inside a room the cops had wired. Alright, there's the stuff in his hand now. Well, you'll get a hold of me in a couple hours then, right? How could he do this in front of the kid? A few hours later, we joined the sheriff and his men at Campagna's home to make the arrest. Okay. What? 
Although traditional, that is, Italian organized criminals are involved in the cocaine trade. They are strictly small-time players. Get that camera out of I ram it up your ass. Yeah. The top dogs are still the Colombians. Men like the recently imprisoned Carlos Letter and the infamous Ochoa family totally dominate the supply, trade routes, distribution, and they do it violently. In a recent nationwide sweep, over 50 Colombians were arrested. 600 pounds of cocaine and almost $50 million were seized. And while we're grappling with imported organized dope criminals, law enforcement is also fighting a homegrown problem. It's the $20 billion marijuana industry. Run by thousands of high-tech yuppies, their motivation is the same as the other organized criminals. Greed. I don't use it at all. I don't like it. But I'm in it for strictly one thing. I'm in it for money. Next, if you think organized crime doesn't affect you directly, you're dead wrong. How the mob moves in on legitimate business when we come back. Cast looking live at Times Square, talking about how the mob had gotten its hooks into the construction business. That's part of a larger pattern the penetration of legitimate businesses. It makes prohibition look like a drop in the bucket. The mob has totally corrupted the largest industry in the largest city in the nation. The mob tax on the building behind me was especially severe. The cement for that building should have cost $5 million. The inflated bid, $7 million. The mob tax, $2 million. The mafia was also paid off for this hospital this diplomatic building, and every major construction project in Manhattan. In fact, everyone in this picture, in some way, is paying off the mob. Here's how. Item, rent, and maintenance. At the successful prosecution of mob boss Carmine Persica, the government proved the mafia had an iron grip on the construction unions, and through them, the major contractors. Item, food. In many big cities, the mob controls the fish market and much of the restaurant business. Certainly, if you said that 10% uh, of the cost of every meal you ate uh, uh, was caused by the excessively high cost, that would not be an outrageous figure. That would be a conservative figure. Item, gasoline. If you yeah. filled up along the East Coast, there's a good chance you've been buying the mobs bootleg gas. Folks in the middle and western parts of the nation have had to make up the hundreds of millions in lost gasoline taxes, taxes that went into the mob's pocket. Item, trash. You can even be paying the mob when you take out the garbage. We secretly taped Jimmy Brown Fiella, a notorious crime family captain, arriving to chair a meeting of the otherwise legitimate Association of Trade Waste Removers. A government bug planted in the jaguar of a mob chauffeur reveals a textbook lesson of how the hoods take over a garbage haulers union. Now, let's take somebody, let's take a son, a son-in-law, somebody, put them into the office, they got a job, let's take somebody's daughter, whatever, she's the secretary, let's staff it with Without people. Without people. And when we say, go to break this guy's balls, they go. Yeah. Seven o'clock in the morning to break the guy's balls. Oh. Wise guy Henry Hill lists just some of the other unions controlled by the mob. The carpenters, the, uh, the laborers union, the bricklayers union, the trucking union, uh, the food handlers union. They have more. The involvement in organized labor is so great, even a tough man like Frank Perdue sought mob help to fix his labor problems so he could continue making his tender chickens. The mob got its hooks into the union movement back in the 30s. So many companies were using hired thugs to keep workers from organizing. Many decent people felt it was okay to seek help from the mob to counter management muscle. But to the despair of millions of honest workers, once in, racketeers like Jimmy Hoffa never left, at least not voluntarily. Uh, union corruption means that people uh, don't get the wages they're entitled to with sweetheart contracts. It means they don't have the vacation time uh, they're entitled to because mob leaders have been paid off. It has an effect on the price of food. It has the effect on the cost of putting up a business. It has a, a, a dramatic effect on the availability of jobs. And if the mob can't get an entire union at once, they settle for a key person or two, just enough to disrupt operations. They snare them with loan sharks and intimidation. in my hands tomorrow. You have it here by 6 o'clock tomorrow night. 
Ed Steer, our next guest, is a former federal and state prosecutor. His investigations into mafia control of the New Jersey garbage industry led to more than 50 indictments. Ed, welcome on the program. What happens when a mob uh, family takes over a union? Well, it's just like any other uh, form of dictatorship. Uh, they take complete control. They may create the illusion that people in the uh, union have, uh, have it good. But in fact, the people in the union have no power. They have no influence. And after a while, when they're stripped of their self-respect and their sense of uh, their responsibility to control their own affairs, they no longer feel it's important to control their own affairs, and they just go along. Specifically, are you talking about the Teamsters right now? Well, there are segments of the Teamsters union that have been corrupted by the mafia, that have been taken over. Uh, when people step forward uh, within the framework of the union to try to clean it up, uh, they're told to keep their mouths shut and step aside to be satisfied with the fact that they've got a job. Now, there are large segments of the Teamsters movement that are made up of decent, hardworking people, and it's those people that we would like to restore control of that union to. We have another guest right now that you're going to hear, you're not going to see him. His name is Harold Kaufman. He was an associate of the Genovese crime family who was sent to organize the New Jersey waste industry for the mob. He later turned on the mob as, uh, and is right now under federal protection. He's phoning in from a location that even we don't know and we don't want to know. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can we hear you? Yes, hello, hello. Okay, great. Uh, tell us uh, about the chemical control company fire in New Jersey. What was the mob's involvement in that? This was a textbook. The mob controlled the solid waste industry, led them into trying to control the, uh, the toxic waste industry. They found the owner, who owed a lot of money to loan sharks in Newark. They forced him out at the point of a gun. His name was Carasino. Then they put three of the top Genovese mobsters in charge of it. Why'd they burn it? Why'd they burn it? You know a better way to get rid of 42,000 drums? Why have you decided to turn state's evidence? I... Make it brief, Harold. We're almost out of time, please. Okay. I never got involved with anything that would hurt anybody. If the wind was blowing right over Staten Island with what they burned, they would have killed hundreds of people. And I decided that was the time for me to get out. See, these guys are scum dogs, ladies and gentlemen. There's no glamour in today's mob. A final word about the Sons of Scarface when we come back right after this final commercial. The face of organized crime is changing, but despite its racial or ethnic coloring, some things about it are the same, the brutality deceit, above all the greed. Not just the greed of criminals, but the greed of every person who goes along with them. And I'm talking about the businessman who pays the mob tax in exchange for a chance to win a rigged bid. The public or union official who accepts the payoff. Even the average guy or girl who buys the hot car stereo or the bootleg gasoline, the untaxed booze or the hijacked cigarettes. Now, crime and greed may just be harsh facts of life, but there are other facts, and I want you to remember them. There are the heroes, not just the Wongs, the Wolves, the Giulianis, and the Goldstocks, but the millions who just refuse to bootleg bargain hunt or to tolerate the corruption that organized crime is forcing on the country and all of society. I'm Geraldo Rivera. We'll see you all again when our daytime series begins in uh, September. Thank you, everybody here, for being with us. Until then. <laughs>